So this is going to be an easy talk because I follow the robot talk, and, and the robot talk, Dr. Qureshi puts up new technology, and he shows up on, he shows on one of the slides. I don't know if you guys saw it, but an iPhone 3. That was new technology for him. That was like eight years ago. Yeah, he's a, he's a MacBook Air from eight years ago as well. I don't know what he does with all his money. I told him he sews it up in the, in the mattress in his house. So the, the reality is I'm actually here to tell you that I don't believe robots are the future in spine surgery. And the, rea and the, the reality is if you look at the robotic application, um, and I can say this, I was an early stage investor in Excelsius, which was the robot that eventually got acquired. I was a, essentially a pre-Series A fundraising investor in Excelsius, which was acquired by Globus. Uh, and then Globus um, has now rebuilt it and is being released hopefully 20, uh, Q3, Q4, 2017. Robots, you know, unlike other parts of medicine, spine surgery, when it, the robotic application was developed, the, I think there was, a, there was a gap in the training and expertise and the experience with surgeons placing pedicle screws. But for the most part, that's really overcome. So we argue for radiation exposure, et cetera, can be minimized in other fashions, you know, whether that be like you know, now radiation reduction as far as the imaging is concerned, alternative imaging modalities. So you know the, the cost of the robot is cost prohibitive as it is. And for, for those who don't know, um, Google and J&J &J have a $1 billion collaboration. It's called Verb Surgical. Basically, Google is entering the space for all medical applications. And they actually have a robot. And I know the CEO of, uh, of Verb Surgical on a pretty good basis. And they have a robot coming out that's going to that is going to disrupt the market. It's going to be a cost-effective robot, not a million-dollar acquisition. And, uh, and they're taking certain augmented and virtual reality parameters and kind of mixing it together. If you look at what the robot does here, the robot doesn't do the spine procedure. It may give you some access, but ultimately the discectomy, the end plate, the decompression, et cetera, the critical portions of the case, you have to do that. So the robot serves only one function, and that's not valuable in a, in a cost containment model. So some disclosures we don't have in my slide. Number one, um, I, I actually am working on I have my own company that has alternative navigation technologies, albeit in quantitative ultrasound imaging, which has some bearing on this. And secondarily, I work with two, two startup companies in a, in a space called Matter in Chicago, which is a medical incubator. It's the largest in the country and looking at augmented and, and virtual reality systems. So I'm not going to talk about those those products. I'll just talk about concepts in general and where we may go and what we're looking at and for people to understand kind of the definitions. So what is, and what Jeff said very eloquently before, what is virtual reality, what's augmented reality, and what's mixed reality? So virtual reality, just to read the sentence, it's a real environmental impression virtually generated to affect one or more sensory domains. Now augmented reality, that's the enrichment or enhancement of physical reality. So what does that mean? Virtual reality is like, for the most common user, Oculus is the most widespread platform. You take your Samsung, you take whatever phone, you put it on, you're gonna watch the screen, you may be, in, you may be on a bike doing the Tour de France or some part of the stage, and it's recreating that for you. Augmented reality is you are actually on that bike participating in the Tour de France, and it's telling you and it's mapping the best route to go, where to take a turn, where to raise your head. It's adding that additional information to you. Mixed reality is somewhere in between, holographically or image-wise creating an image. You're seeing what appears to be the landscape. Some of it's recreated so you can see further, and then it's telling you information superimposed upon that. That may be wind resistance, it may be humidity, other, everything else that you can adjust accordingly. So there's a, blurred, there's a blurred line in between, and then there's two separate kind of functionalities. And in some ways, you can say, like, take, for example, Nuvasiv and Neurovision. Neurovision is not, it's kind of a mixed reality. You don't really look at the EMG. It's actually virtual reality, right? You have this thing that's interpreted. Augmented reality would be actually showing you the location of the nerves and the distances to it superimposed on somebody. So if we take those premises and we look at kind of how this has evolved, 
the robot actually has not evolved much since it was first utilized in surgery in 1985. Yeah, the articulations are better, but that's about it. If you look at most robots, most robots are coded in some kind of C++ with a QT frame. So basic code, and depending upon the code in the application, you can increase the sophistication of the robot. It's easy to make it smoother pivoting, arm articulation, mechanical component. But the reality is what Shiraz touched upon, how accurately can you translate what it needs to feel or what it needs to sense or how it needs to locate to make it more, more applicable in spine surgery. So if we look at this, if you look at all the robotic applications, for the most part, people who do very well with the robot or with navigation, and I tried navigation in my own OR, I didn't have the I didn't have the ability to overcome some of the learning curve issues. But those surgeons who do very well with those technologies are very good surgeons in general who then use it to get a little bit better. It's hard to take the novice surgeon who doesn't necessarily feel the pedicle start point, who doesn't know if the feel of cancellous or cortical bone, the general trajectory, because you have to correct the robot when there's mistakes. So it really hasn't blurred the line between reality and augmented reality. So if you look at the, the evolution of the robot, and we actually did some stuff. One of my partners actually, one of my good friends, is a urologist at Rush. And I don't know if Rick is gone, but he, he's a slick surgeon at Rush, and he does all the Da Vinci stuff. And he came actually out to Seattle. I don't know if you guys know, but um, Virginia Mason is one of like the pioneering centers for Da Vinci applications, and Swedish probably is as well. It appears that Seattle is just a mecca for all these technological advancements. And we started doing combined Da Vinci, ALIF, and kind of like a modified OLIF, thinking that what, I, what we did was he would go in, and there's essentially laparoscopic, but you go through, and I know the data on the laparoscopic was too time consuming, no benefit, but we tried to play around with it. And what we did was he would sweep the retroperitoneum literally very quickly, and then I'd put a, we'd put a K wire down the middle and then I'd pull the K wire out essentially or puncture through the skin and connect the K wire and then put a series of dilators and kind of work through that, minimizing the retroperitoneal kind of manipulation. And we didn't really see any difference in the patients, but it attracted a great marketing kind of like patients came in for robotic assisted, you know, lumbar fusion surgery with no clinical benefit. And ultimately he was too busy, I was too busy to kind of like push that forward. And the reality is that's what I believe in large part is the robot. If you look at most robotic applications, they end up being for pedicle screw placement for which most surgeons are very comfortable placing pedicle screws currently. And yeah, the arm and articulation is better, but they're not really taking us to a whole different level of, uh, of I guess, technological or technique advancement. So these are the robots in some kind of variations. And this is a video it's a Nuvasive video, but I want to show you, and I have no conflicts with Nuvasive, no, um, no bias towards Nuvasive. I want to show you kind of the augmented reality. Can we play that video? Let's do this. The cheesy actor is. I apologize. Whoa. a combination that's kind of mixed reality and there's a company that I invested in now seven years ago as part of this matter it's called touch surgical I don't know if you guys know touch surgical is and it was a company out of France startup company and we were a series a financing financer for this company and I thought it was the worst idea possible so basically they had an iPad and they would take you through eight steps of say an appendectomy and they would give you five instruments on the right hand side and you would touch each instrument to say the first step would be a scalpel. And then the next step after that would be you pick out and then you take a bovie and you take the bovie and you take with your finger on an iPad and you just kind of draw out the line. 
And I said, this is worthless, not going anywhere. But my other partners in this, in this little fund of ours said, no, it's going to be great. The market's ripe for it. So we invested in it. And we invested some portion, a small amount of money, end up being like 1.5% or 2% of this company. So if you look up Touch Surgical and you Google it, uh, DreamWorks, you guys know DreamWorks? So DreamWorks and um, uh, another major investor I'm blanking on right now put a bunch of money in. So the valuation of the company is a little under a billion dollars at this point. Why? Because surgical and medical education is huge market, huge market. And if you look at surgical and medical educational training, unlike if you want to be an airplane pilot, which is a commonly common thing, it's, there's no standardization to it. And there's no way that we actually can minimize a learning curve except to, I hate to say it, experiment on patients. And we think that's okay in some way. But if you actually ask the, the public and healthcare professionals outside of medicine, that means outside of physicians or paramedical uh, uh, people, that's offensive. That's hugely offensive that they are, in fact, learning on this. You know, you, you, you guys are all in the situation. I, I have fellows, residents. I wouldn't trust them to go operate, but we graduate them because there's no competency testing. So augmented reality and virtual reality systems are very important. But what's the failure in those systems currently, much like the robot? It's haptic feedback. Do you guys know what haptic feedback is? So haptic feedback is what you have on your iPhone now, you know, in some sense. It's actually best on a PlayStation 4. Have you played it? You're rolling. It gets resistance when you're turning into a lane. It shakes. It vibrates. You don't have that. 90% of what you do as a surgeon is actually not visual. It's haptic. It's, pa it's feedback on that. You palpate the mammary process. If I put, you know, if you could use your fingertip, and you could touch the mammary process, you could feel that starting point. When you put your gear shift into the pedicle, you're feeling the resistance, you're not seeing. Yeah, you may sense like, okay, I'm a little bit sepulchral, but you're really feeling. And that's where the failure is. So systems have advanced. This is a company that I'm working with actually in Matter, um, Immersive Touch. Premise being, controlling this system, much like a, la, like a Da Vinci model, uh, and having actually resistance. So it's placement in pedicle screw. The difference between a human with haptic feedback and a robot is tremendous. The human automatically auto-corrects. You know when you're plunging. Yeah, you can build in certain parameters to a robot, but the robot is only defined by what you program into what its safe zone is. But a human con continuously adjusts no matter the environment. So if you can provide a haptic feedback system, well, that's the future. We can, at this point, if you look at it, if Google's getting into it, DreamWorks is getting into it. Pixar was getting into it. They're looking at, they can create the reality for you. But the one challenge, you know, even with the robot is, can you give the feedback to the surgeon? So that's one of the challenges. The second challenge, and this is kind of looking at the pedicle screw, this is a simulation model. And you're actually, you know, you're actually, you have the screen on. It's actually essentially an Oculus-based platform with a haptic sensor built into it. Uh, and, and it improves the learning curve. So now you take this surgical trainee and you give him a real life scenario to advance better to pedicle screws. And why do I mention this? Because if you look at it, the robotic application, people always tell me the robot application is for scoliosis surgery, you know, those challenging surgeries. But what if we could create a model that's a scoliosis patient and you can now do that with the haptic feedback a thousand times, the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours. Do you really need the robot at that point? The robot becomes disposable. You just, need a, you just need an environment that's better than the cadaver lab to train on and to learn on so that you develop that feedback. If I can give you real-time feedback in a real-time environment, then you can overcome that learning curve. That's much cheaper, safer, and it's much more practical as we move forward in this kind of cost containment delivery, healthcare delivery system. So here's a review article that was in the Spine Journal looking at you know, various simulators for spine surgery, and there are a bunch of them out. They're, most of them are virtual reality based, so they're gonna recreate that environment for you. So you're not really seeing the real world, they're creating the environment for, for you. And almost all of them are done in pedicle screw and vertebral plasty. Those are the two kind of things, because they're essentially synonymous, right? They're both the same 
you know, placement of a jam sheet into a pedicle screw. And the reality is you can show improvement. You can also show improvement with surgeons who just go to a cadaver lab and routinely place pedicle screws. So nothing novel there. But what, we're, what you're learning is that there is a plateau. And the plateau is reached because there's no tactile feedback. And ultimately, a simulator group you can learn to get better, but no one can really overcome that feedback. And to be a good robotic surgeon, I think you have to be a good surgeon in some capacity to, able, to be able to adapt and adjust the robot in real time. So if you look at kind of the future applications, and I'm gonna talk about this conceptually, and I think Jeff mentioned HoloLens. So, you know, the, the company that I have that, that we're working on is to take, this is augmented reality. What if we could do lateral spine surgery in real time, and you could pass your initial dilator down, and in one second you, just move it forward on the psoas and back on the psoas. And then it took that, took that plexus map and put it onto your fluoro shot. So now that's augmented reality, right? So now you have the entire plex on your fluoro shot, non-fiduciary based. That means you don't have a marker. I don't know if you guys watched Dr. Koresh, he put his screws in, but for a second he blocked the line of sight, the thing went black. Two, you can't move the patient. He didn't mention spine mask on fat patients. It moves a lot, it's less accurate, but it's true. All those things that we have in real time. So HoloLens, Google Glass, which is coming back. There's an application that I've seen. Now you can imagine the first step is proof of concept. So we now put it onto a fluoro machine. You have a live shot of a fluoro and you have your plexus on there. The second is actually the surgeon actually never looking up at that screen, right? He's looking through his lens and he sees the patient normally through his loops and then it superimposed the plexus is on top of that. So now he's seeing the patient and as he's moving, he can see the plexus change. And so now that's the augmented reality. There's one or two companies that are very much in their infancy, and this is not that far away. It's just that medicine has been so far behind in incorporating some of these technologies. But what people realize is the profit margins are huge in medicine. So it's only, much, it's only a little time before disruption occurs. So now they have lens projections where you can actually take, you're looking at the patient, and you can actually see the CT and the MRI overlaid. The problem is some of the coordination of the imaging, and it has to be some kind of fiduciary-based marker system currently. There's certain ways around it. And I'll tell you one of the novel techniques around it. One of the techniques around it is actually when you first go into surgery, you actually put down, you spray a film down, and the film has microbeads, and the beads actually are like essentially like a glue on top. It's FDA approved. You have the little, bot, little dots, these little nanospheres, and then you take a fluoro shot, and then based upon that, now it can kind of coordinate position. And then it'll take a reference point, and you can go off of that. So now you can move the patient, and then you can look through this lens. That is much cheaper and much more effective than a robot because a surgeon is still doing the surgery. He's not stepping away from the field. He gets to actively see what he needs to see and he's not looking externally. So homogenizing that experience is kind of the next step. Google Glass, HoloLens, I would put Verb Surgical also on that. This is not that far away. So the other component is now to address that via tactile feedback. There's some concepts, you know, that placing the EMG stim on the probe on your fingertip itself and using that for dissection as opposed to a dilator. Because you think of what we do, we do best. Someone mentioned earlier, I think it was Addison, you can actually feel what muscle feels like. So when you're going down, why do we then put a dilator to feel what muscle feels like when our finger is the one that we can feel what muscle feels like? So there are different concepts that actually put that with the tracker, and then the fingertip actually functions as the wand itself onto the image. Uh, and that actually is kind of the next evolution to incorporate haptic and tactile feedback as well. So all of these things are to improve the surgeon decision making and to improve the surgeon experience. If you really think about what you do, you know, if you look at the nuvasive neurovision and the EMG stem, and you look at simple things that could be done, and clearly they thought about this, but they haven't done it because it's just not cost effective at this point. Why not make your dilator the one that changes colors? Why look up to the screen? Why not make your distance on the dilator itself? That's the simplest mechanical step. The second step is actually, why not project that information onto your lens? The third step is, why not project that onto your lens and then onto your fingertip 
that's telling you through your fingertip you're seeing as your dilator essentially that information on your fingertip while you're feeling. It's actually not that many jumps. The jump is when you go from the screen to the augmented reality on your fingertip. But the evolution is actually around the corner. So I would actually say, these are some references that are, I think, in, uh, interesting references. I would actually say, uh, going back, I don't believe the future is the robot. I think the robot's kind of antiquated in spine surgery. The pe placement of pedicle screws can be improved by a, a real life simulator or an augmented reality for the surgeon who has the map of the images and can real time adjust. And it wouldn't be a capital purchase from the hospital. I don't know how many hospitals can afford to buy a million dollar you know, robot. How many can afford to do that when these, when these surgeries are switching outpatient into a, a different environment? When a simple Google Glass software programming and licensing arrangement is much more cost efficient for the future. And two, the surgeon does the surgery in these procedures. Yeah, you place the pedicle screws, but that's not the surgery. The surgery is still the decompression. It's still everything else around it. And that's why I think the future is augmented or a mixed reality kind of picture. Thank you.